July 30th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Esther, Chapters 1 and 2 from the Old Testament. The following events happened in the days of Ahasuerus. I am referring to that Ahasuerus who used to rule over 127 provinces extending all the way from India to Ethiopia. In those days, as King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign he provided a banquet for all his officials and his servants. The army of Persia and Media was present, as well as the nobles and the officials of the provinces. He displayed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor of his majestic greatness for a lengthy period of time, 180 days to be exact. When those days were completed, the king then provided a seven-day banquet for all the people who were present in Susa, the citadel, for those of highest standing to the most lowly. It was held in the court located in the garden of the royal palace. The furnishings included linen and purple curtains hung by cords of the finest linen and purple wool on silver rings, alabaster columns, gold and silver couches displayed on a floor made of valuable stones of alabaster, mother of pearl and mineral stone. Drinks were served in golden containers, all of which differed from one another. Royal wine was available in abundance at the king's expense. There were no restrictions on the drinking, for the king had instructed all his supervisors that they should do as everyone so desired. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in King Ahasuerus' royal palace. On the seventh day, as King Ahasuerus was feeling the effects of the wine, he ordered Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, Abegtha, Zether, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who attended him, to bring Queen Vashti into the king's presence wearing her royal high turban. He wanted to show the people and the officials her beauty, for she was very attractive. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's bidding, conveyed through the eunuchs. Then the king became extremely angry, and his rage consumed him. The king then inquired of the wise men, who were discerners of the times. For it was the royal custom to confer with all those who were proficient in laws and legalities. Those who were closest to him were Karshina, Shethar, Admetha, Tarshish, Meres, Marcina, and Memucan. These men were the seven officials of Persia and Media who saw the king on a regular basis and had the most prominent offices in the kingdom. The king asked, By law what should be done to Queen Vashti in light of the fact that she has not obeyed the instructions of King Ahasuerus conveyed through the eunuchs? Memucan then replied to the king and the officials, the wrong of Queen Vashti is not against the king alone, but against all the officials and all the people who are throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the matter concerning the queen will spread to all the women, leading them to treat their husbands with contempt, saying, When King Ahasuerus gave orders to bring Queen Vashti into his presence, she would not come. And this very day the noble ladies of Persia and Media, who have heard the matter concerning the queen, will respond in the same way to all the royal officials, and there will be more than enough contempt and anger. If the king is so inclined, let a royal edict go forth from him, and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media that cannot be repealed, that Vashti may not come into the presence of King Ahasuerus, and let the king convey her royalty to another who is more deserving than she. And let the king's decision, which he will enact, be disseminated throughout all his kingdom, vast though it is. Then all the women will give honor to their husbands, from the most prominent to the lowly. The matter seemed appropriate to the king and the officials. So the king acted on the vice of Mamukin. He sent letters throughout all the royal provinces, to each province according to its own script, and to each people according to its own language that every man should be ruling his family and should be speaking the language of his own people. When these things had been accomplished and the rage of King Ahasuerus had diminished, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decided against her. The king's servants who attended him said, 
let a search be conducted in the king's behalf for attractive young women. And let the king appoint officers throughout all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the attractive young women to Susa, the citadel, to the harem under the authority of Haggai, the king's eunuch who oversees the women, and let him provide whatever cosmetics they desire. Let the young woman whom the king finds most attractive become queen in place of Vashti. This seemed like a good idea to the king, so he acted accordingly. Now there happened to be a Jewish man in Susa the citadel whose name was Mordecai. He was the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish a Benjaminite, who had been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the captives who had been carried into exile with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had taken into exile. Now he was acting as the guardian of Hadassah, that is, Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for neither her father nor her mother was alive. The young woman was very attractive and had a beautiful figure. When her father and mother died, Mordecai had raised her as if she were his own daughter. It so happened that when the king's edict and his law became known, many young women were taken to Susa, the citadel, to be placed under the authority of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the royal palace to be under the authority of Haggai, who was overseeing the women. This young woman pleased him and she found favor with him. He quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her rations. He also provided her with the seven specially chosen young women who were from the palace. He then transferred her and her young women to the best quarters in the harem. Now Esther had not disclosed her people or her lineage, for Mordecai had instructed her not to do so. And day after day Mordecai used to walk back and forth in front of the court of the harem in order to learn how Esther was doing and what might happen to her. At the end of the twelve months that were required for the women, when the turn of each young woman arrived to go to King Ahasuerus, for in this way they had to fulfill their time of cosmetic treatment, six months with oil of myrrh, and six months with perfume and various ointments used by women. The woman would go to the king in the following way. Whatever she asked for would be provided for her to take with her from the harem to the royal palace. In the evening she went, and in the morning she returned to a separate part of the harem, to the authority of Sheashgaz, the king's eunuch who was overseeing the concubines. She would not go back to the king unless the king was pleased with her and she was requested by name. When it became the turn of Esther, daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had raised her as if she were his own daughter, to go to the king, she did not request anything except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was overseer of the women, had recommended. Yet Esther met with the approval of all who saw her. Then Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus at his royal residence in the tenth month, that is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she met with his loving approval more than all the other young women. So he placed the royal high turban on her head and appointed her queen in place of Vashti. Then the king prepared a large banquet for all his officials and his servants, it was actually Esther's banquet. He also set aside a holiday for the providences, and he provided for offerings at the king's expense. Now when the young women were being gathered again, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther was still not divulging her lineage or her people, just as Mordecai had instructed her. Esther continued to do whatever Mordecai said, just as she had done when he was raising her. In those days, while Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who protected the entrance, became angry and plotted to assassinate King Ahasuerus. When Mordecai learned of the conspiracy, he informed Queen Esther, and Esther told the king in Mordecai's behalf. The king then had the matter investigated and, finding it to be so, had the two conspirators hanged on a gallows. It was then recorded in the Daily Chronicles in the King's presence. God, I, I love the book of Esther. Um, it's so unique in the fact that it never mentions you. 
uh, the only book in the Bible that doesn't mention you yet. As we continue with the story of, of Esther and and Mordecai and the king and, and what happens in this very dramatic story, um, we see your fingerprints all over the story. We see your sovereignty. We see your grace. We see your power. We see your control. There isn't a single part of the story that doesn't have you in it, even though you're not named by specifically by name. And it's almost like the characters in this story know it. Um, as, as I continue reading this and recording this, I hope everyone listening can hear that, that it's almost like they know that, that events are being handled above and beyond what they are doing. Now we do see obedience and faithfulness, obviously in Esther and, and Mordecai in what they're trying to do, more so in Esther, <laughs> Mordecai a little bit, um, in, in what they're trying to do and tr in trying to be obedient to you. And even though we know that you reign sovereign over our lives, God, we are still responsible for what you've called us to do, to that obedience, to that faithfulness, and they definitely were. Um, we see we see very much parallels in the story with Daniel, which is another book I really love. Um, when he is in captivity with his friends and his dedication and insistence and persistence to what he knows of his God, which happens to be you. So these stories where your power is so evident, which is, of course, throughout all the Bible, the people in the stories become fascinating in their obedience, in their faithfulness, uh, in their disobedience even, in your desire to make things good for what you need them to be to come out of them. Um, going back to the beginning with Queen Vashti's disobedience, and you'll hear uh, a lot of people argue about this and say she had every right because the king was commanding her, he was probably really drunk. Um, but we know what the Bible says about marriages, even though the king had a lot of wives. Technically, this was his one wife, the queen, and he had requested something of her and, and she was supposed to be obedient to that. Um, and then the follow up of that, the concern of other people will watch Queen Vashti do this. Other other women will watch Queen Vashti do this and will follow her example. And and even though there's a little bit of a, an agitation there, um, people like to argue kind of a men against women thing. I think there's more going on here, especially reading this for the umpteenth time that I have. Than, than what we are paying attention to if we just look at this as a story. Queen Vashti, her disobedience to her husband had multiple effects from that one choice, that one choice to not be paraded around to his friends while he was drunk about how beautiful she was. Because she was disobedient to him, he in turn was wrong and his ego flared up and his anger flared up and he put in motion quite a few things that were wrong, were errors. In fact, at one point in the story, we even hear that he missed her. He, he kind of wished he had made a different decision. And then, and then his court um, of knowledgeable people says, oh, well, let's, let's make another sinful choice. Let's wave a bunch of virgins in front of you and see if we can't distract you. So choices after choices after choices are made. And unfortunately, at the beginning of the story, all the choices made are bad choices. Yet here's the amazing thing. We see you come in, reign sovereign with your control, and you make them all good. And I think it goes back to Romans 8, 28, where you talk about making all things good. And we mess this up a lot. We think good means good things, um, good in our worldly sense. And it doesn't mean that at all. In fact, if you actually do the translation for the word good in there, um, as you already know, God, it means it's talking about good morals. Um, it's talking about the moral piece of that. And so the morals, the values, um, you are going to take whatever is bad, either that we have chosen something to do that's bad, something that's sinful, or something that's been t done to us that was bad, um, and you're going to make it good for what you need that situation to be. And it's 
it's truly one of my favorite things about you without a doubt. I have watched you take my life, which was a multitude of bad choices, bad things I did, bad things people did to me. And here you have made them good for everything you need them to be. You have honored and blessed me by giving me a ministry where you allowed the videos we create of your word to reach people all over the world. That is baffling to me that you would take somebody who lives such a horrid, sinful life, uh, couldn't be further away from you if I had tried, and, and now you've, you've sat me down and showed me the truth, changed my heart, showered me with forgiveness and love, grace and mercy, and handed me a ministry. So it's amazing to me how this story starts off with bad choice after bad choice after bad choice and even far reaching choices that they start to make laws about worrying that the choices of, Qu of Queen Vashti are going to affect other people and then they're going to make bad choices. But we see, not to give away the rest of the story, but we see you take all of this swirling around of bad choices and you bring in your people into the situation who are faithful, who are obedient, doesn't mean we get everything right, but faithful and obedient. And you're able to, out of all of these bad situations, make good, make good morals, good values, good for what you need them to be for your glory. And we need to remember, God, that this is all for you. As nice as it sounds to be in a spa for a year, <laughs> that would be kind of nice. Um, we have to remember that all of these things are done for your glory and in your timing. Your timing that Queen Vashti would become um, arrogant and dismissive of her husband in front of his friends. That was timing. Uh, the fact that it was four years later before Esther was put in front of the king. Um, that was your timing. Uh, everything has to do with with your perfection, your control, your sovereignty, all for your glory. God, I just thank you for the book of Esther. I think it is unique in the fact that, as I've mentioned, it doesn't mention your name in the slightest, but it, it couldn't be more clear a story of your power and your sovereignty and our responsibility to be obedient and faithful to whatever you've called us to. Even if it sounds a little bit odd, like having to play makeup things for a year <laughs> and put on perfumes and bathe in oils, no matter what it is that you've called us to, we're called to be obedient, not to question what is happening, but to be obedient and let you do the good work that needs to be done. In your son's name we pray. Amen.